All right, so in Proverbs chapter 21, we see a lot of, a lot of familiar uh, passages that are kind of brought up again in this, in this chapter. We've been going through, you know, we've gone through 20 chapters of Proverbs already, and you'll notice certain themes that are recurring. So I'm not going to spend too much time in, in, the, uh, in some of the verses, so we're going to skip over some of them as we go. I'm not going to really expound on them a whole lot because we've done so in the past, and I'm going to try to, to focus on some things that I haven't really spent a whole lot of time on as we've been going through Proverbs. But let's look down at verse 21. We're still going to, we're still going to read, uh, cover all the verses. I just probably won't go too in-depth into some of them. Verse number 1, the Bible reads, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. God has the capability, and we see this, this multiple times, he will often use... A person in power to make sure that his will is done. So um, we saw with Pharaoh, you know, when the children of Israel were, were, were under bondage and God wanted to make sure that his might and, and his strong arm was, you know, was known unto the world. He had Pharaoh in that position of power and, and even ended up hardening his heart to make sure that, that, you know, he didn't let the children of Israel go because God wanted to get all his glory for himself, right? Other times we see where God uses other nations to attack and to bring judgment upon other nations. There's times where God will use a ruler and, and is able to influence them to, um, to do the things that, that he wants them to ultimately end up doing. Now, we're not Calvinist here. We don't believe that God just, just completely, you know, is, is determining everything that people do with all their lives and, and, and every single aspect that they do is just foreordained and God just pre-programmed us to be a certain way and to do certain things. We don't believe that at all. But there are times when God can have influence on people and the way that God's able to do some of these things See, God knows the hearts and God knows, like, I think God's able to, 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 I mean, for one, he has foreknowledge. So we know that much. We know that he knows who is going to put their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ in their whole lifetime. He knows that already in advance. He knew that from the foundation of the world. But he's able to put people in situations, I think, that based on who they are and the decisions that they are making and, and knowing that person. So like to be able to fulfill, for example, um, you know, Jesus Christ's betrayal and being, tr you know, uh, Judas being the traitor. I don't think God made Judas to be the traitor, you know, like that God just from birth, like Judas is just, is just, foreordained that he is like has no choice in the matter of, of being a traitor but I think God made the circumstances knowing Judas and who he was and the, you know and the decisions that he, he makes in his life just generally that he is able to put him into that position and allowed him to make the choices but still was, was um, you know God had worked to, to, to have that that person there and, and I think he does the same thing he's able to do similar things with the kings you know, and, and use certain people. Um, Pharaoh is a great example of someone who hardened his own heart and wouldn't let the children of Israel go. And then God ended up hardening his heart later on as the plagues got worse and worse to where any normal person would say, enough is enough, let these, you know, let them go. God ended up hardening his heart. But um, anyways, it's, it's a real interesting verse there. It shows us, it says, the king's, the, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. Um, even though God generally has a, has a hands off, he definitely has, has ways of, of um, getting things done here on earth. Look at verse number two. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. Another verse that, that's come up in, the, in Proverbs in the past, but uh, very important to just recognize and understand. Yeah, everybody thinks that they're doing the right thing. Right? I mean, I know, I think that I do the right things here just in general with the church and with, you know, the things that we do and the things that I preach. Otherwise, I wouldn't say them or do them. Everybody thinks that they're right in their own eyes. But see, God knows our hearts. You could act a certain way in front of people. You could, you could think you're doing the right thing. But God knows. God knows everything. God knows the truth. And um, we need to keep that in mind also. Look at verse number eight. We're going to jump down real quick. The way of man is froward and strange, but as for the pure, his work is right. Now, jump up to verse number three. This is something that I'm going to be spending a little bit more time on tonight and kind of expound a little bit more in depth. Verse number three says, To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. 
Justice and judgment. We're going to get into this a little bit. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We've got a backwards teaching, I think, in many churches today regarding the topic of judging and judgment and sacrifice. So the Bible is saying here to do justice and judgment is more acceptable. God is more pleased when people are doing judgment and they're doing justice than He is when people are giving sacrifices. See, oftentimes what you hear more frequently is you giving a certain sacrifice. And unfortunately, in a lot of churches, it's a financial sacrifice, right? Dig deep in your pockets. We need more money and, and pour it out. you got to give this big sacrifice and God's going to bless you and all this other stuff. And you hear this preached over and over and over again. And if it's not someone looking for money, then it's just, you know, constantly just, just what can you sacrifice? What, you know, what is your sacrifice for God? Now look, I'm all for making sacrifices for God. Don't get me wrong. But the problem is when you have an imbalance. The problem is when that's all you're ever talking about is whatever you can sacrifice to God as opposed to understanding and doing, not just understanding, but doing justice and judgment. Also, a word would be synonymous with these justice and judgment would be equity. Doing what's right. Making a judgment on things that is accurate and that is, that is right, that is correct according to God's word. People today want to just say, don't judge, don't judge. Oh, you can't judge anyone. Look, you're always judging. And when you say don't judge, you're judging. You're passing judgment by telling someone else not to judge. We all judge. And there's nothing wrong inherently with judgment. And in fact, God says that doing justice and judgment is more acceptable than sacrifice, than what you could personally give. Just doing what's right and just calling a spade a spade. And, and, and this is the way it is. Now, judgment specifically, though, is you have to be involved in some sort of judging, but you need to be doing it righteously. A righteous judgment is what this is talking about. And just to show you, though, in 1 Corinthians 6, this concept of Christians judging. Because it's like a, it's like a cuss word amongst Christianity these days of saying, oh, you judge, judge, you know, judge not, judge not, Matthew 7, judge not. 1 Corinthians 6, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Now, first of all, do people ever have problems with other people, even in church? Yeah, it happens all the time, right? People do wrong to someone. Look, it's, it's, called, it's called life. You could say up and down how it shouldn't happen. We shouldn't have problems with people, but it's going to happen. And it happens all the time. And there's plenty of situations that arise daily where you need judgment on something. You need to determine who's right, who's wrong, what's fair, what's right, what's a good recompense, who did who wrong, and what should be done about it. That's justice, right? You think of justice, of the, the scales, right? Justice means you've got, you've got whatever done on this side, weighing it down. Well, you need to balance that out on the other side to make it equal, equity, just. And that's what God does. See, God does that with our sins. When you think of like any sin that you could commit on this side, the way that God balances out our sin is with hell, with that punishment of hell. And that's, that's our punishment. But see, thank God, He put someone in our place to pay that punishment for us so that the justice is still served. The punishment's already been paid. But, but we can have someone you know, substituted for us to, to make that payment for us. Thank God for that. Believing on Jesus Christ does that for us. But um, let's keep reading here because this is, this is an admonishment to the church. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth and, and explaining to them, you need to be judging. This is one of the things they weren't doing right. They weren't judging. Look at verse number 2. And when they had problems, when they, when they, they wanted judgment to be done, they brought it to the unbelievers. They brought it to the heathen instead of taking care of, of it in the house of God. In the house of God. Yes, judging was supposed to be done in the house of God. In church. Look at verse number two. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? He's like, don't you know that the saints are going to judge the whole world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? If that's what's going to happen in the future, the world, the whole world is going to be judged by the saints. When Jesus Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom here on earth for a thousand years, 
to rule and reign. The saints are going to rule and reign with him. If we are going to be judging in that kingdom, he's saying, I mean, that's a much bigger deal, ruling and reigning with Jesus and, you know, over people in a kingdom as a, and, and can't you just take care of a few small matters that are coming up within the church? I mean, when you have a problem with someone else, can't you at least deal with that? If the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Look at verse number three. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. This is, a, this is to the church. There was nothing wrong with having a judge, with having someone to be able to determine you're wrong. And see, that's what people don't want to hear, though, and that's what they call judging. And it is judging. When someone says, you're wrong, that's not right. What you did was wrong. But we live in this, in this, this world where everybody gets offended super easy, and you can't say anything anymore because someone might get upset. And it's this, this weird world that, that is turning into of, of, you know, I need my safe space and no one can say anything to me because I'm, my feelings might get hurt. Look, this is life. You need to get over it. People do things wrong all the time and they need to be told that they're wrong or else how are they ever going to do what's right? How are you ever going to do that? And how are you going to teach the kids? How are you going to teach anybody between right and wrong if you can never say anything about it and you can never judge? Because that's what happens when you don't judge. You never know what's right and wrong. Because it's never being said. It's never being spoken of. We need to be able to judge. Turn, if you would, to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19. We're going to show you a bunch of examples here. Just in general about how normal and right it is to have judgment. And to understand that proverb that says to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. God says that's better to have justice to have judgment, to have things done right, to have a, a, a proper judgment being, being meted out. Now, again, the, the world is going to tell you that it's, it's, it's a good thing and it's a nice thing and it's a great thing for, for people to have a more lenient sentence for, for crimes that are, that are you know, it's, that's the way we're headed. I mean, the vast majority of the crimes, just in general, the sentences are getting lighter and lighter and lighter. Unless it's, unless it's something that there's some special interest involved that they really want to stamp that out, you know, like the drug trade or something like that, where they'll put some heavy, you know, an imbalanced, you know, justice or ju judgment done on their crimes. We're, we're all out of whack these days. But look at, I just want to show you this in Leviticus 19. Look at verse number 2. The Bible says, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. So this is a message. The reason why I'm looking at verse number two, this is a message from God to Moses saying, Speak unto all the congregation. He said, This is a message for the whole congregation. And he goes down, and you can read it in context later. I'm not going to do that now. We're going to jump down to verse 15. And he's telling them all, these, the, all the congregation, This is what you need to do. Do this, do this, do this, don't do this, do this. As you read Leviticus 19, jump down to verse 15. At no point does he say, this isn't for you. It's still in context to the whole congregation. Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. Don't judge me. You're judging your neighbor according to the law, to, the law, to God's law, saying... You are supposed to judge. But what he's saying is judge righteously. That is what needs to be done. We're judging, but we're judging righteously. Now look, I'm not calling for unrighteous judgment. And, I, and don't get this wrong, because I think sometimes people say, you know, can have a legitimate complaint and they, they call it judging when it's really people just having a holier-than-thou attitude that just kind of want to lift themselves up over everyone else. But... The way that we handle that is when you're on the receiving end, don't think of it as the person having the holier than thou attitude. Be humble. You know, if you need to be corrected on something, take the correction. 
But if you're the one doing the judging, you know, keep that in mind too, that it's a righteous judgment and that you're not just, just have a pompous attitude about yourself, but you could, you could, still, you could still deliver a righteous judgment in, in, in fairness and equity. And you know what? Sometimes a righteous judgment, there's no soft way of saying it. It just is what it is, depending on what's going on. But he's saying here, when you judge, when you judge your neighbor, he says, don't respect the person of the poor or honor the person of the mighty. You know, whether they're poor, whether there's, they have a lot of influence, whatever the, whatever the case is, don't judge based on who they are, based on the facts, based on what they've done, what, what actually happened. Doesn't matter who the people are at all. Don't let that cloud your judgment. Oh, well, this person's my friend. Oh, this person's really well liked. Oh, they're popular. They're famous. So we're going to go easy on them, right? Oh, they're running for president. So we're going to throw all the laws away that any other person, if any other person did this, they're going to prison because they, they gave away top secret information and they, you know, they, they did all these things that anyone else in that spot, that's called unrighteous judgment. That's what God's saying not to do. Don't be a respecter of persons like they were doing with Hillary Clinton and her email scandal and everything else and everything else that she's been doing as a criminal and just sweeping it under the rug. Oh, you know, we're, we're not going to prosecute. We're not going to do anything here, even though anyone and other examples of people have done the same thing, have been thrown in prison, have lost their jobs, have been disgraced, have been dishonored, but not her. That's respecting persons. That's unrighteous judgment. And here, this is, they're saying, speak this to the whole congregation. We all need to have a proper judgment when we judge. And when we judge. It's not a, it's not a curse word. Turn if you go to Exodus chapter 23. Exodus 23. Just one book back from where you're at. Exodus 23. Different aspects is what we're, what we're looking at now for, for judging righteously. We saw not to respect persons, not to, it shouldn't matter who they are that's, that, that you're judging, but what was actually done when, when pronouncing judgment. Exodus 23, look at verse number 2. The Bible says, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. What this is saying here, what that means is, is you don't have to worry about what's popular, right? Just whatever the popular opinion is, don't rest or twist or pervert judgment because you're going, you're following in the way of what the popular crowd is saying, right? Like the perfect example of this is Pontius Pilate. Do you remember that? When Jesus was standing before Pontius Pilate, he's saying, look, I find no fault in this man. Look, what did he do that's worthy of death? He didn't do anything. He knew what the right thing to do was. The just sentence would have been, he's going free because he didn't do anything. He didn't prove anything to him. But what was it? it what was, was popular? All the people were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. You're not Caesar's friend. Get rid of that man. We hate him. We want him dead. And what did he do? He perverted judgment. He did unjustly and delivered Jesus to be put to death when he knew he didn't do anything wrong. It's a perfect example. But there's a pressure there. And see, you need to remember that when, when it comes time, when, if you ever have to make certain judgments on things, whatever's going on, you'll be pressured by, by different people, by influential people, by whoever, to do the wrong thing. Don't let that sway you. That's wicked judgment. Jump down to verse number 6, Exodus 23, verse 6. Thou shalt not rest the judgment of thy poor, in his cause, keep thee far from a false matter, and the innocent and righteous slay thou not, for I will not justify the wicked. Again, and you're going to find over and over again, and I don't have to, like I didn't, I didn't put too many examples in my notes because a lot of it would just be repetitive, but when you look up judgment in the Bible, and very frequently you're going to find the poor and the needy being put in there when he's given admonishment on how to judge. Because it's really, really, really easy 
for judgment to be perverted against those that are poor, those that don't have money, those that don't have influence, those that don't have the best education, those that aren't able to, to understand all the legal, legal speak and the, the legalese of the courtroom and, and don't understand when to raise objections and, 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 and how the whole process works, even though they're innocent. You know, the person that's doing the judging should be able to recognize that and still be able to make a proper judgment and not just just always go against the, you know, the poor man because they can't do anything about it. They're helpless in their situation. A righteous judge would, would be able to um, not discriminate against the poor. Or even just discriminating against them because you could say, oh, well, you know, someone got accused of stealing. Say, well, they're poor, so they probably did steal and just, just say, well, that's, you know, that's where your judgment is based off. You can't, you can't do that. I mean, you, you, unless, unless, if you don't have the facts, you can't just say they did it because they're in this situation. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1. You say, yeah, but I don't find myself in that many situations, you know, where someone's done me wrong or someone's done someone else something wrong and, 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 and I'm actually called upon to make some kind of judgment here. But that's not the only judgment that happens. There's actually judgment that happens all the time. And literally, just by preaching God's word, there's automatically a judgment associated with that. I judge three times a week at least. Because every time I'm preaching out of the Bible and I'm hitting on anything that's coming from like God's law or God's word, I'm, I'm, there's a judgment being thrown out there. Just by saying this is right, this is wrong, you should be doing this, you shouldn't be doing this, that is making a judgment. Even when preaching salvation, there's a judgment. And when we're preaching the gospel to someone, when you tell someone they're a sinner and they deserve hell, guess what? That's a judgment. But is there anything wrong with doing that? Absolutely not. You're, you love them. You're telling them the truth. Hey, you're a sinner. And I'm not telling you that because I just think I'm so much better than you. I'm a sinner too. But you need Christ. Because if you don't receive Christ, you're going to hell. And that's a fact. And that's a judgment, but see, the judgment isn't yours. The reason why it's right, the reason why it's good is because God is the judge and the judgment comes from Him and His righteous judgment. All you're doing is repeating it. All you're doing is just being the messenger and telling, hey, ultimately, the reason why you're going to hell is because God's the judge. He's the just one. He's the one that said, look, you break my commandments, you're going to hell, and I know that you've broken His commandments because there's not one that's righteous, no, not one. Deuteronomy chapter 1, look at verse 16. The Bible reads, And I charged your judges at that time, saying, Hear the causes between your brethren, and judge righteously between every man and his brother and the stranger that is with him. Ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man. Don't be afraid of what people, the faces people are going to make as a judge when people are you know, giving you dirty looks and looking at you like they're going to kill you, whatever the case may be. Don't worry about that. He says, for the judgment is God's and the cause that is too hard for you, bring it unto me and I will hear it. That was Moses instructing the other men that he was going to have help him be judges uh, in the land since it was too much for him to bear alone. He says, don't respect persons. Don't worry about who it is. You're going to hear the small. You're going to hear the great. No one's going to get any favor. I don't care how much money someone has. They're not getting to the front of the line. You, you know, everybody gets judged equally, the same way, under the same law. God's law, don't give preferential treatment to anybody. And he says, and don't worry about what people are going to think about you. Don't worry about the rich man who's going to be giving you dirty looks and trying to threaten you or whatever, trying to make you pervert judgment to rule in their favor. Don't worry about that. He says the judgment is God's. And if someone has a pro if, if you are reading and, and preaching God's word appropriately, the way that it's written, and someone gets mad at you, hey, don't worry about it because they're not really mad at you. They're mad at God. The judgment is God's. Unless you are perverting, unless you are twisting it. But if you're just you calling it out the way that it is, the way that it's written, that's God's judgment. It's God's judgment that says people are going to hell. It's God's judgment that says, you know, sodomy is a sin. It's an abomination. It's God's judgment that says, you know, that stealing is wrong. It's God's judgment that says not to lie. It's God's judgment that says all these things. And, but people don't want to hear that because people don't want to hear that what they're doing is wrong. So they're going to call you judgmental. 
You don't got to worry about that because the judgment is God's. And as we've already seen, turn if you go to Psalm 82, as we've already seen, there's nothing wrong about judging. You just need to do it righteously. It needs to be a righteous judgment. But I, I, I'm, I'm literally, I'm so sick of hearing this. Oh, you're judging, judge, 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 judge. And people are getting so brainwashed by this wicked world. Psalm 82, look at verse number 1. But it's God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Selah. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. See, the wicked people are always looking to trample on the poor and needy. That's been happening forever. It's going to continue to happen. But righteous men need to be able to stand up and say no and be able to defend the person that can't defend themselves. You know what? God does that for us. And we need to likewise do that for other people. When you're in a position to be able to help someone else out, to help someone else in need that can't defend themselves, you need to be able to stand in there and do that. And you better not go along with the wicked and participate in an unrighteous judgment against someone be just because you know, well, what are they going to do? Right? We have a lot, there's a lot of cops out there today that are doing that very thing. That, that persecute poor people, homeless people, because what are they going to do? They're not going to sue them. They're not gonna, they don't have the money to, to hire a lawyer to come back at them. Now, I'm not saying every single police officer is, is wicked, but it happens a lot. There's definitely a lot of people out there getting taken advantage of and getting pushed around and getting bullied and, and, and being judged right off the bat and, and having all kinds of judgments come against them where there is no real judge. It's the being judged by whoever is right there who thinks they have authority over them and power over them because they're defenseless, because they're poor, because they're homeless, because whatever. That makes God angry, by the way, when you do, you know, if you ever are faced with that situation, don't even think for a second that, that you can get away with something like that against the poor and needy. But it's, it's our job as, as people who are righteous to be able to stand in their way and to help the, the, the poor and the needy to be able to be um, judged justly. Now look, it doesn't matter. You, know, you also don't have sympathy on you know, the poor and needy. If they do something wrong, you know, then they need to pay for it. I mean, if, when, the, when, the, when a poor person gets caught stealing... You know, the Bible says they're still supposed to pay that, that fine, their punishment. They still need to pay back fivefold or whatever, it, you know, whatever the case may be according to the law. You know, you still carry forth a just judgment. Even though they're poor, you still have to do you, you have to keep everything equal. It has to be the same. That is the definition of proper justice and judgment. And that is what God likes and that's what God expects from us. It doesn't matter if it's your family member. It doesn't matter if it's a friend. It doesn't matter if it's someone that you hate. Justice needs to be served blindly. Go back to Proverbs 21. We're going to see some more verses in Proverbs now that are talking about justice and judgment. Because we saw the one verse, and I, and I kind of went in and, and, and showed you all these other verses from, you know, from the Old Testament and New Testament about judging and the, and the way to properly judge. But what we started there with was verse number three, to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. God is pleased with a righteous judgment. Because your, your a righteous judgment is coming from his words anyways. You're doing exactly what he told you to do and judging the way that he would have you to judge. That is much more acceptable, God, than anything that you can offer up of your own when you're just being obedient, following what he has and executing his righteous judgment. Look at verse number 7 in Proverbs 21. The Bible says, The robbery of the wicked shall destroy them because they refuse to do judgment. And it's going to destroy you if you refuse to do judgment. The, the wicked, they go out and steal from people. And, and again, they're not doing judgment. They're just going and doing whatever they want to do. Proper judgment would tell them, no, stealing's wrong. I'm not going to do this. And that destroys them. They refuse to do judgment. Look at verse number 15, Proverbs 21, 15. It is joy to the just to do judgment. Well, these days, with all the Christians, they're going to you know, hammer you for judging. You're, they're ruining this proverb that says it's joy to the just to do judgment. They're trying to make it not joyous for you to do judgment. 
But it should be joyous. It is a joy to the just to do judgment, but destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. And then look at verse number 13. The Bible reads, Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. So are saying when you hear someone, and again, this, this, this is just one more verse throughout the, yeah, that's the, of many in the Bible where God is showing you that he really cares about the poor and needy and the helpless and, and those that, that, that don't have to take care of them. And he's saying when you stop your ears, it means you don't hear them. You're pretending like they don't exist and just, just completely ignore them. He says, okay, I saw that. Here's someone in need. Here's someone's poor. Here's someone who needs some help. And you just stop your ears to that and you just keep on going, whatever, and just put them out, put it out of your mind. He says, yep, guess what? You're going to cry yourself one day. You're going to be in a, in, in a time of problem, in, in a, tri a time of trouble, and you're going to need help, and no one's going to hear you because you didn't, you didn't help that person out when they needed it. Even Jesus Christ himself said to judge. You don't have to turn there, but in John 7, verse 24, Jesus Christ said, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment, which basically sums up everything that we've already looked at when it comes to judging. There is unrighteous judgment that we definitely shouldn't be doing, but when you're just saying what the Bible says, when you're saying, hey, this is a sin, you're saying, hey, we shouldn't be doing this, hey, that's wrong, hey, that's right, that's making a judgment. Even saying someone's doing something right is a judgment. It doesn't have to be a negative. You are judging when you say, hey, you did a really good job with that. You've just judged them. So Proverbs 20, we'll look at verse number four. In high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. Verse 24 kind of goes along with that one. Proud and haughty scorner is his name who dealeth in proud wrath. I'm not going to get into pride. Uh, there, we, we've done that in the past. Uh, look at verse number five. The Bible reads, The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but of everyone that is hasty only to want. This is a real interesting verse, a, a real... Um, Again, a lot of great wisdom here. And I'm not going to spend too much time in this, but we've spent time in, in the past of people who work real hard versus those that are real lazy and, and, and um, slothful. But here it says, the thoughts of the diligent. You know, people who work hard and diligent, the thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but of everyone that is hasty only to want. People who work hard, it's not just about... about um, I think a perfect example of this, there's someone, back when I used to go out and eat fast food all the time before I got married when I was, at, you know, when I was working and I was single, every day for lunch we would just, we'd go off and get some fast food somewhere. I'd eat Burger King, Wendy's, McDonald's, Taco Bell, whatever. And back before I even realized what I was doing to my body by, by ingesting this stuff. But regardless of that, we would go, there was this person at Wendy's and uh, it, was, it was actually pretty comical because she moved real fast, but was really inefficient. So it kind of gave off the appearance, like, oh, wow, that's a really hard worker. But she wasn't a hard worker. Like, like, she might have been working really hard, but almost working against herself, because she was always just going back and forth and kind of running back and forth and doing this and doing that. And it's like, you could do the same exact job <laughs> without looking like you're just a whirlwind kind of going all over the place. And this is what it reminds me, you know, the thoughts of the diligent tend to only to plenteousness because the diligent, the people who are hard workers, you know, you ought to also be thinking about your work and planning it out and, you know, and, and being very efficient. You know, yes, being on top of it. Yes, not just sleeping in the morning, getting up and doing your work, but also having a plan and thinking about it. It says, but of everyone that is hasty only to want. See, just running out and doing something can backfire on you without having a good plan, without, without knowing what you're doing. You, know, you still need to be diligent about making the plan, about going forth and working, but just being hasty about it isn't going to help you either. It's, uh, it's going to lead only to want. It's, it's going to make you um, not be um, doing as good of a job as you ought to be doing. But then look at verse number 25. We saw about the, the thoughts of the diligent. Verse 25 says, The desire of the slothful killeth him. The desire of the slothful killeth him. For his hands refuse to labor. He coveteth greedily all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. 
the desire of the slothful, the things that the, the lazy person wants to have, it kills them. It says because you know, his hands refuse to do the work. He's too lazy to even actually do it. He wants all of this stuff. He's greedy and covets after things that he doesn't have, but it's sin and it's wicked and it's going to kill him because he coveteth greedily all the day long, but he's not willing to get up and work for it. And that is the trap of the slothful. We need to make sure you never become lazy. It says the desire of the slothful is going to kill you. It says, but the righteous giveth and spareth none. The righteous is going to be diligent. The righteous is going out and working and has enough to give and not spare. Whereas the lazy person just wants, right? The lazy person, slothful person, they just want, 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 want. The righteous person is able to give. They're not worried about want, 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 want. They go out and work and provide for themselves and are able to give and spare. Now, that means they don't have to withhold. They could, they could, they could give freely. And again, it needs to be noted. I'm not preaching a, a prosperity gospel, if you will, okay? You could be a righteous person. I'm not saying God's going to make you wealthy and extremely rich in this world's goods. But if you work hard and you're not covetous and you realize what your true needs are, not your wants, what this, not what this world tells you is what you need. Not saying, I need air conditioning, I need this, I need that. You don't need a cell phone. You don't need a data plan. You don't need all the stuff that, that commercialism is telling you that you need and that society in general, because other people have it, you feel like you need. When you work hard, you will have what you need and enough to be able to give to other people who are truly in need. Keep that in mind. A lot of people think, well, wait a minute, am I not righteous then? Because I'm working hard and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, but I don't have anything to give to anybody. Is it just because you're spending too much on yourself? On things that you don't really need? I mean, look, and I'm not saying it's a sin to, to buy things for yourself. That's not a sin. But the mindset of what you even really have and how much you truly have. It's too easy to look at other people and say, I don't have anything. When you're judging based on what other people's physical goods are, instead of what your needs are and what God has provided for you. When you're diligent and you work hard, you will not be begging bread. It's not going to happen. Look at verse number 6, Proverbs 21, verse 6. The getting of treasures by a lying tongue is a vanity tossed to and fro of them that seek death. People get rich off of being deceitful, off of lying. It says that's a vanity tossed to and fro. Which is, I mean, it's, it, the, that wealth and stuff they have is all vanity, and that's, it's meaningless. What they get, and basically they're seeking death because they're, they're ripping people off. Um, but I'm not going to get too much into that tonight. Look at verse number 9. Verse number 9 and verse number 19 in this chapter go together. Verse number 9 says, It is better to dwell in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. And verse 19 says, It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. Now, there's something to be learned here from husbands and wives, I believe. Women, don't be fighting with your husbands. You're going to be driving your husband away. Because the Bible is saying here, you know, it's better to dwell in a corner of a housetop. I mean, just to go, you know, go way up into the attic and just, just kind of go off and hide. Than with a brawling, I mean, brawling, you know, just a real contentious. That's what it said in verse 19. Contentious, someone has this, a woman has this, fighting all the time and in a wide house. It's better just to be in a little small space and to not to have much. But, to, you know, to be in a house where there's love and, and to be with someone that's, that's um, not going to be fighting. And I mentioned this in the sermon previously, but I'm going to bring it up again. You know, when the man is the head of the household, the husband is the head of the household. He's the one in charge. He's the one that's giving direction. He's the one that's saying the way that things are supposed to be within the house. And the wife's role is to obey. 
and to run the house and to do all these other things. Now, it doesn't mean that the husband's always right in his judgment, is always correct in the things that he does, is always the smartest but he is the one in charge. Now, when the wife is fighting with her husband, you're, 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 it's like you're usur usurping the authority that God has given to the husband. And what you end up doing is driving your husband away. Women, your wives should not be fighting with their husbands. It's not right. It's not biblical. But husbands also, you need to learn how to lead your wives so that you're not always provoking them either. See, even though it's wrong for, for the woman to just be, you know, constantly just fighting and being contentious and, 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 and kind of being disrespectful and, and, and just arguing and fighting all the time with what, with what the husband's saying, you don't need to be, you know, adding, you know, fuel to the fire. You don't need to be provoking and just, and just, and just always trying to, to, to um, you know, get the fight going. You don't always, you know, and look, I get it as a husband. Sometimes you need to prove a point of, of that you're in charge, but you don't, you know, when you, when you lead in a way and, and try to prove a point and you're being a jerk about it, you know, your wife has feelings too. And when people get, get hurt, they have a tendency to react and, and kind of lash out. You don't, you don't want, you know, keep that in mind. Keep that wisdom in mind so you're not just provoking. That you're not just 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 instigating and, and you know doing things that you know I mean for no good reason is just gonna just gonna upset your your spouse upset your wife but um, you know I mean these are both and, and these phrases or these these verses that we find here verses nine verse nineteen they're also mentioned in a few of the other proverbs we mentioned it before you know it comes up multiple times it's not just one verse and even one verse is enough to preach on but. This comes up more than once of saying, like, it's better to go out in the wilderness. You know, wives, think about that. If, if your husband's always going out hunting, he's always getting out of the house, he's always wants to be away, he's always leaving. Ask yourself, am I being contentious and angry? Because it might be one of the reasons why your husband doesn't want to be around. Because the proverb says here, hey, it's better to be out in the wilderness. It's better just to be out in the middle of nowhere than to be around a woman that's just going to fight with you all the time. No one wants to be around that. It's like a continual dropping. Let's move on here. Look at verse number 10. The soul of the wicked desireth evil. His neighbor findeth no favor in his eyes. When the scorner is punished, the simple is made wise. And when the wise is instructed, he receiveth knowledge. The righteous man wisely considereth the house of the wicked. But God overthroweth the wicked for the wickedness. The righteous man, the one that knows right and does right, he's going to wisely consider the house of the wicked and have nothing to do with it because God overthrows the wicked. He's going to look at that and say, yep, that's wicked. I have nothing to do with that and, and completely avoid it. Look at verse number 14. A gift in secret pacifieth anger and a reward in the bosom strong wrath. A good way, if you come into disfavor with somebody and you want to make things better, a good way to do that, you know, is bring a gift. Or maybe you've done something, someone wrong You've wronged them. You want to appease their anger? You make someone angry because you, you screwed up some of theirs, you've damaged their property, you've done something to them? Bring them a gift. It works. It's wisdom. I mean, this is saying, look, a gift in secret pacifies anger. Just go up to them personally and say, hey, I'm sorry what I did. Here, here you go. I know you like this. Here, you know, here, have some food, have whatever. You know. It pacifies anger. A reward in the bosom, strong wrath. You could really get people to, to back off a little bit. Remember Jacob and Esau. When Jacob was coming back into, into the land and, and Esau was coming to meet him and they're like, hey, Esau's coming. He's coming with, you know, with all these soldiers. You know. and, and what did Jacob do? He kept sending forth gifts. Kept sending forth because he's thinking like, all right, maybe he won't be quite as angry because he's probably real angry right now because when he left, he wanted to kill him. And he's thinking, like, he's probably been stewing over this for all this time, and he just wants to kill me, and he can't wait to get his hands on me. So here's what I'm going to do. And it was a wise thing to do. Send up all these gifts. Hey, you know, what's this? Oh, this is from, from your servant, Jacob. You know, he just, just he kept on coming, drove after drove after drove. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us the intent that Esau had at the beginning, but we know the outcome. We don't know what he was thinking or what his heart felt, but he was coming with, you know, three or four hundred of his servants. Of, of like soldiers. I mean, he was, I mean, he was coming, 
with a company of people. If he was just coming to say hi, he probably wouldn't have brought that many people. So the inference is there. We don't know that for a fact. But what ended up happening? He was happy to see him. He, he forgave him. And everything was fine. And he gave him all of those gifts. And I think that those gifts did help uh, pacify his anger. But we know that the Bible says here that it does so anyways. Um, and experience will tell you the same exact thing because it's truth. Look at verse number 16. The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. Verse 17. He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. If that's what you live for, just to have fun, just to go out and, and, and party it up, live it up, drink it up, whatever, you just love pleasure, fornication, you're a poor man. Be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. You need to ask yourself, what do you love? And you know, one of the ways that you know what you love is what you spend your time doing. That's a big indicator of what you love. You know, we all have these ideas in our head of, of what we think we love, the way that we see ourselves, the way that we want to be. But what you actually do and your actions are going are gonna to tell you where your actual heart is. Is it on the physical treasures? Is it on just getting pleasure? I mean, how do you spend your time? You know, think about that. How do you spend your time during the week? What do you actually do? Where are you spending your time? Are you spending your time just on Facebook? Are you spending your time on wh whatever? I mean, some hobby? You could think, I love God the most and I want to serve God the most and this is what I want to do and this is why I'm in church tonight. But are you reading your Bible every day? Are you trying to memorize? Are you trying to do all these things? We say, well, I don't have time for that. Well, then what are you spending your time on? And that will show you what you really love. You say, but I really do want these things. I really do love it. I really do want to serve the most. Okay, that may be what you want in your spirit because your spirit is trying to do what's right, but your flesh is weak. And what you're really giving into is going to be evident in your own life. So examine your own life when you, when you think about that. And just the wisdom here, you know, if you love just pleasure and just always sing about vacation and just kicking up your feet and doing whatever it is just to please your senses, you're going to be a poor man. Verse number 20. There is treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man spendeth it up. And here it's saying, basically, it's wise to have some savings. It's wise to have a little bit put aside. It's wise to put, thing, to put some money away for a rainy day. It's wise to have the, 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 the oil um, you know, and the things just kind of stored up. In the dwelling of the wise, you're going to have those things. But the poor, the fool, I mean, excuse me, the foolish man just spends it up. Everything you have is just gone immediately. If you're wise, you're going to have a little bit of something extra put aside. Verse number 21, He that followeth after righteousness and mercy findeth life, righteousness and honor. Uh, jump back to verse number 18, The wicked shall be a ransom for the righteous and the transgressor for the upright. We skipped that one. Okay, now go back. Go to verse number 22. We're almost done. Verse number 22. A wise man scaleth the city of the mighty and casteth down the strength of the confidence thereof. This is a, I, I love this verse. I spent a lot of time kind of meditating on this one. A wise man scaleth the city of the mighty. He's talking about scaling the walls, right? The city of the mighty. He scales the walls and casts down the strength of the confidence thereof. The people inside of a city, a mighty city, and... You have to think back a little bit here. You think about their walls as their protection, as their defense, and their feeling of safety and comfort is going to come from these great walls and their big defense, and we're a mighty city and no one can penetrate, no one can get in. It says here that the wise man scaled the city and cast it down the strength of the confidence thereof. So just getting in the ears of the people and, you know, like, this wall isn't going to save you. You know, this, don't, don't put all your confidence in these rocks. You know, don't, don't be so focused on this physical, you know, border around you, about this, this physical thing here, because the Bible says here, and I'll just, I'm going to go a little bit out of order. It says in verse 31 there, the last verse, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. You know, you, you can have these walls all you want, but the true safety, the true defense you're going to get is it has to come from God. You need to be right with God. You can't just be trusting and have your confidence in the strength of these walls. But another way you can look at that too is saying, hey, you know, the wise man, if, you, if you're looking to get into that city and cast them down, cast down their, their, their strength. Get them questioning. Get them, you know, not to, um, to be relying and, and being so confident and have them more wavering 
in their strength to give you more of an advantage there and uh, defeat them from the inside out instead of trying to, to break down that wall. Look at verse number 23. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. Great wisdom there. Watch what you say. Mouth get you in a lot of trouble. Verse number 27. I know we're kind of jumping around a lot, but I, I grouped some of these together that, that sort of, uh, you know, kind of talking about the same thing. Verse number 27. We see the sacrifice of the wicked. And this is the last major point we're going to have in the sermon. And this actually goes really close with what I started off the sermon with, with the, with the sacrifice and the judgment and the, the justice. Look at verse 27. The sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. How much more when he bringeth it with a wicked mind. So we saw already just to do judgment, to do justice, that's more pleasing to God than sacrifice, than to give something of yourself, than to, to take what you have and to give it to God. He, he's much more, it's much more pleasing to God to just be doing right, doing what's just. But it says here, the sacrifice of the wicked. So when the wicked comes in and wants to give some sacrifice, God hates that. Don't think that your sacrifice, that whatever it is that you're giving, that God's pleased with that whatsoever when you're going out and living some wicked life. And what this verse reminds me of is the typical Catholic, right? The ones that want to go out, live it up, party up, and then on Sunday they go into church and just go into their confessional and everything's just fine. That's their little sacrifice, right? Oh, well, I'm going to go to church on Sunday, so that just makes up for everything else that I do wickedly and live as, live as wicked as sin throughout the whole week, and I'm just going to go in, and then it's all going to be okay because I'm going to give my little sacrifice of saying a few Hail Marys. I'm going to give my sacrifice of, of whatever it is that the priest tells me to do. That's abominable. God hates that. Amen. God hates that. And that's judgment for you. That's righteous. That's what the Bible is saying here. How much more when you bring it with a wicked mind? So when the person comes in, they live however they want during the week. They come in and they know in their mind, you know what? Right after this, I'm going to go out because it's Sunday. I'm going to get drunk and watch some football. They bring in, they do their little sacrifice. They're living like hell, and even with a wicked mind, God hates that even more. Confession, Lent, all that stuff. There's just wicked people trying to give some sacrifice as if God needs your sacrifice. He wants you just to do what's right. He doesn't want your sacrifices. He's the one that sacrificed for you. Jesus Christ was the one that was sacrificed for you. Why don't you just accept that and get right with God? Don't worry about how much you can give to him. He doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your, your, your vain prayers. He doesn't even need you showing up to, to some temple somewhere. He needs you doing what's right. Turn, if you would, to Amos chapter number 5. Go forward. It's in Minor Prophets. Go forward through to find Amos chapter 5. I'm going to read for you from 1 Samuel Chapter 15, after Saul had disobeyed God, he disobeyed the commandments and he took matters in his own hand and, and was doing things he shouldn't have been doing, uh, uh, Samuel rebuked him. And, and I brought this, ser this, uh, verse, these verses up multiple times in sermons in the past, but um, very important to remember. Uh, uh, you're turning to Amos 5. I'm going to read for you from 1 Samuel 15, verse 22. The Bible reads, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Does God, does God, does it make God that happy to just receive all these burnt offerings and sacrifices as it is for just to obey him? He says, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the, the fat of rams. Because see, what Saul was told to do was to annihilate and completely wipe out everybody and everything in the city. And he didn't do that. He didn't obey. Instead, he brought back the best of the flocks and the best of the sheep and the best of the goats so that they could offer them up as a sacrifice to God. Thinking, oh, wow, look at how great we are. I know God told me to destroy everything, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to give it as a sacrifice to God. Here you go, God. Look what we brought back for you. He says, no, that's wickedness. That's one of the reasons why God removed him from being the king and gave it unto David because he wants to give it to someone who's just going to obey him instead of worrying about some sacrifices he's going to make. He says, for rebellion, which is what it is, when you're not doing what's right, you're rebelling. 
For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. He doesn't care about your stupid sacrifices. He doesn't care about the animals. He wants you to obey him. Look at Amos chapter 5, verse 21. The sacrifice of the wicked is abomination, is what Proverbs said. It's an abomination. God hates it. When you do wickedly and try to offer up some sacrifice. Amos 5, verse 21. I hate, I despise your feast days. And I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. But let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. That's what he's asking for. He's saying, get, get your, your feasts out of here. Get your sacrifices out of here. Get all these things that you're doing. You think this is going to make me happy, and it's not at all. I'm really angry with you. But you know what I want you to do? Let judgment run down as waters. Be just. Give proper judgment. And righteousness is a mighty stream. Do what's right. Don't be worried about how much you could give to God. If you're struggling, with you, if, you, if you're trying to figure out what you could do and how you're going to serve God and stuff, don't worry about how much money you could put in the plate. Don't worry about what you could give for God if you're not doing what's right. First, get right. Start doing judgment, justice, listening to God, being righteous. Then you can worry about giving the sacrifices. Then you could start going to the next step of, of doing more and maybe saying, here, God, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to you. Uh, I'm, I'm doing judgment. Now I'm going to try to offer you even more. I've I'm, 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 got step one down of just, just listening to what you got for me to do. And that step one's hard enough, okay? <laughs> and no one does it perfectly. But when you, when you find yourself in sin, you're doing what's wrong. You know what God wants from you? He doesn't want you to, to, to give him some sacrifice, but to make up for what you've done wrong. He wants you to get right. He wants you to be repentant. He wants you to get sorry and say, I'm sorry, God, you know what? I'm not going to do that anymore and get right. That's what he wants. He wants you to just do what's right. I'm going to skip this last reference. I think you got the point. I don't want to belabor it. Let's, uh, we're almost on here. Look at verse number 28. A false witness shall perish, but the man that heareth speaketh constantly. A wicked man hardeneth his face, but as for the upright, he directeth his way. There is no wisdom, nor understanding, nor counsel against the Lord. Anything that's contrary to God, you know, there is no wisdom. There is no wisdom and understanding comes from God. There's nothing contrary to that. There's nothing contrary to God's wisdom. It all comes from the Bible. There is no wisdom. There is no understanding. There is no counsel that's against the Lord. Anything that is wise, anything that, that has understanding is going to go with God. It's going to be um, in harmony with the Lord. And then, of course, verse 31, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. And I mentioned that earlier about you know, trusting in God for your safety. But you, know, you could also read this too, which, which it absolutely means... But, um, you know, the horse is prepared against the day of battle. There's nothing wrong with having defenses at all. I mean, you should have your horse prepared against the day of battle. You should have, you know, you, 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 you know as Jesus said, you know, hey, you don't have a sword? Go sell a, gar you know, go sell a garment and, and get one. Make sure you have your defenses, right? Lock your doors. Make sure you have, but just understand that that is alone isn't going to save you. You need to have, God, you know, safety is of the Lord. We need to be going to God first for all our protection. Make sure we're right with Him. Make sure He's not going to be bringing judgment upon you because you're living wickedly. Make sure you have that settled first. But hey, still, you have your horse pre prepared. You could have yourself ready. You carry a firearm, whatever, you know. The, the, it's, it's all wise things to do. Just make sure you have the understanding that you're not relying on the walls of your city. You're not relying on your security camera. You're not relying on your guns. You're relying on God. 
It's wise to have you know, yourself prepared, but, but the reliance and the trust needs to be in the Lord. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these great words of wisdom. God, I pray that you would please help us to be righteous in our own judgment. God, help us not to shy away and be scared or, or afraid to, to make judgments and to just say, hey, this is what the Bible says. I mean, so many people today don't even know the Bible at all. And they may get offended when they hear it, dear Lord, but just because they get offended, help us not to just shy away from saying what's right. Help us not to, to be scared and biting our tongues and letting wickedness just abound and letting people continue in their ignorant ways, dear Lord. Help us to have the strength and the boldness to say what's right, to do what's right, dear Lord, to do justice and judgment. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.